Thank you for listening to another Remake Rewind. This is Mike, as always. I've got my buddy Alex with me. What's up, man? Hello. Nothing. What's up with you? Oh, it's been a it's been a day, week, month. It, it's been even a year. your year. But we're not yeah, here to complain so about that. We're we're still dealing with the uh the leaky roof, which you alluded to in our, our bonus episode that we had uh come out over the weekend. And uh we ended up having to write a very strongly worded letter uh and throw out some legal jargon in there to get our landlord to actually activate which so I dropped off the letter with my rent and then also paid to have a certified letter sent so that way they can't say they didn't get it. And Jesus uh, Christ. Sure enough, I got a phone call today, and he's like, oh, we're going to take care of it. We're going to take care of it. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. But uh, our apartment looks nice, but the walls are shit. I went to put up a new like toilet paper holder on the wall, and the wall just crumbled around it. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's insane. I remember you talking about getting that place. You were like, stoked on it. Um, we were so stoked. Like It was one of those situations where they just had like a, a combo lock on the door, so you can go and see it like anytime mm-hmm. you wanted. And we must have seen this place like eight times, like together, Katrina and I. And then we each went and saw it on our own a couple other times. And like it is still like the best apartment we've had in terms of like it's it's quiet. We never hear our neighbors. <laughs> they they bait and switched you though. That sucks. Yeah, it it really does. Like it's uh, it's very unfortunate because we've we've now been here two and a half months, and almost a month of that we've dealt with leaky ceilings. Yeah. So. Good shit. Yeah. Eat the rich. (laughs) (laughs) How's your GameStop stock doing? I didn't. I I don't have enough capital to fucking get in the stocks. Like, um, (laughs) I I was fine. Well, GameStop stock earlier this year was like $2. So you just need to get in early. Well, it just dropped a lot today, though. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been following I, over the weekend. It, it got up to 480 on Thursday or Friday, oof. and uh, today it is uh, 85. Yeah, I um before Robinhood decided to like do their shady shit last week, I actually I'm like, well, maybe I can throw in a couple hundred bucks. You know, if I make a couple hundred bucks, cool. If I lose a couple hundred bucks, it's not the end of the world, kind of thing. That's so I thought about it, but because so many people are going into these apps, like it's taking way longer than normal. Like normally yeah. it's supposed to be a three day turnaround to get your uh, account approved. It's I signed up on Wednesday and I think I got it approved this morning. I still haven't been. And I signed up, I think Wednesday as well. Yeah. So I, I think I might throw, go for AMC since it's only like nine bucks. Like I can get, you know, throw a hundred bucks into that. And if it goes up I, a couple bucks. Yeah. I feel like cool. if AMC, um, AMC might go up again, they might do this, the same GameStop squeeze again. Um, next or this week i guess so maybe it goes up you make a little bit of short uh, cash but even if that doesn't happen i don't think they're going out of business and movie theaters are going to open this year so yeah. whenever that happens I'm, I'm thinking of throwing in a couple hundred bucks in amc because i guarantee in a couple like in a year or so it'll pick back up yeah even so, less than that i think and in worst case scenario like a hundred bu- bucks like i'm not going to be buying it on on loan like all those wall street guys are so i won't lose anything more than <laughs> yeah. what i put in like i won't owe any more money so it's yeah. like it's still fairly low risk so i might do amc but it's it's all a matter of whether or not my app gets uh approved or not yeah remake rewind stock hour hour <laughs> business hour. uh business but yeah boys. we're gonna be talking about uh this is gonna be our first i think actually our first valentine's day special like ever uh, oh yeah, it is a Valentine's Day special. Yeah, so we're coming up next month. Will be the four year anniversary of the podcast, but uh, it's uh, yeah the first time we've doing Valentine's Day. So we're doing uh, romantic comedies. We're doing yep. the Shop Around the Corner at, from 1940, and then we're doing the 1998 Meg Ryan Tom Hanks classic You've Got Mail. You've Got then, Mail. Uh, we'll probably do My Bloody Valentine next, just to still stick with the theme, but uh, welcome. Be be our thing. But uh, have you seen either of these movies? I've seen You've Got Mail um, many times. As have I. It's um, one of Katrina's I, go-tos. Yeah. I did not even know. I've not seen it recently, but like we had um, you know, HBO and Cinemax or whatever growing up, and it came out in uh, 94, right? 98. 98. Um, so in my house, that would like I would just go watch HBO, and whatever's on is what you watch. And um, this movie came up. A bunch. And I just watched it because it was on, and I've seen it many times now. 
Yeah, it's one of our, our go-to. So uh, it's that, Sleepless in Seattle, The Holiday, and uh, um, the Christmas one, Love Actually, are kind of like the romantic comedies we go back to over and over again. Sorry, Did I, I lost you? you for a second. Hold on. Yeah. So, yeah, I've seen the the newer one, God, dozens of times, but the Shop Around the Corner I've never seen. Yeah, I've never seen Shop Around the Corner either. Um, what's, I did not even like. I didn't even know that it was a remake. What's funny is like I I actually own the Shop Around the Corner it, because it came with the Blu-ray of You've Got Mail. Like we traded in the DVD and got the Blu-ray because Best Buy had a promo. They used to run these promos like once a quarter where you can bring in any Blu-ray and you would get a. Uh, the first time they did it was a ten dollar credit, and then you can go and buy blu-ray versions of the movies so i did that a few years ago with this movie and it's not even advertised like if you just look at the case for you've got mail on my in my dvd shelf it just says you've got mail but when you open it up there's a second disc in there for the original one so it's crazy i got lucky i already had it <laughs> yeah look at you i had to rent it yeah idiot. luckily i made uh, enough money on the stock market this weekend to pay for that so nice but this is technically you've got mail is like the third remake so the this was a uh, based off a of play a uh, hungarian play and then it was the movie uh the shop is the that corner. why it's said in, said in hungary it is yeah i was uh, wondering about that because it does not feel like it needs to be i didn't know it until like after i watched it i looked up why is this in hungary and it's like yeah it was based off a of hungarian play then it was the movie and then it was a broadway musical and then they made a Muse a movie off the musical and then you've got mail so wow. it's, it's it's just so much history yeah <laughs> or something yeah so you want to you want me to summarize the first one or do you want to do it do the pitch uh, you can do this one I'll, I'll do all right you've got mail all right so jimmy stewart he's hot oh, hello yeah. i'm gonna oh. be a mover uh <clears throat> excuse me uh, I can't remember her name. It's Margaret something or other. Mm -hmm. But she's pretty cool. Fuck. I feel, Margaret Sullivan. <laughs> we got Jimmy Stewart, Margaret Sullivan. They're oh, they're back together. Right yep. Putting them back together. They they came up in the uh, old acting troops together, and we really want to get them in a romantic this. comedy. Yeah. Uh, and they were in part of like an acting troupe together too so they knew it, they were really good friends for years before this movie so uh, we want to put them in a uh, a movie this is going to be low budget we're going to film this uh out in hungary and it's gonna we're only going to film for like a month and it's it's going to be cheap but it's going to make a ton of money what do you say i mean yeah i like money let's do it yeah so the basic plot of this movie super simple um jimmy stewart james stewart whatever you want to call him uh he's the top salesman at this leather work shop and uh he is gunning for this promotion but for whatever reason his boss decides that he doesn't really like him anymore because he thinks he's having an affair with his wife. Meanwhile, uh, Margaret Sullivan, who plays Clara, shows up and wants a job. And uh, they just kind of get off on the wrong foot. And each one of them have a pen pal that they're writing to and think that they're going to get engaged to this person. And uh, it ends up being each other. Even though they hate each other, they actually love each other. Aw. Yep. Was this actually shot in Hungary? Uh, you know what? I don't know if it actually it looks like shot in Hungary. It looks like a back lot in Burbank. It, it does look like a back lot. Like it's, it only has like two locations in yeah. this whole thing. Like 90% of the movie takes place in the store. Yeah. There's like a scene in the hospital and like one scene at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Like um, apparently like this movie, like the, 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 the director Ernst like talked a lot about how he wanted to make a cheap movie. So this only costs like $500,000 and shot in less than 28 days. And they also shot this movie sequentially which doesn't normally happen. So yeah, wow. yeah, they shot this from beginning to end chronologically for those who don't understand what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. Usually you shoot movies out of order for budgetary and logistical reasons. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Very, very rare to movies film in order. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm just going to say at the top, like I hadn't seen this one, but I, I thought it was very delightful. Yeah. I had a good time with it. Um, it it feels very dated for sure. <laughs> it's from 1940, so not 1940, really, yep. Not a surprise there, but there are a number of moments um, that just don't like make sense in today's world. Like what? Name name four. Name four? No, just That's, name one. <laughs> um, maybe I shouldn't have brought it up because I didn't have one ready to go. That's just <laughs> my that's my overall feeling. I mean, yeah, it's definitely 1940s. Oh it well. Definitely... I mean, first of all, like the both of them think that they're going to get engaged to their pen pal 
immediately. Like the yeah. the, the woman, um, what's her name, Clara? Clara. Literally says, uh, when you see me on Monday, I might be engaged. And I was like, really? After one date with this guy? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's definitely weird in that that regard. And then it's also like interesting how it's like the small shop is owned by this like rich man. And he talks about like, this is clearly before all the labor laws we have now. So it's just on that cusp. And it's also Europe. But he basically is like, you come in when I tell you to come in. You work when I tell you to work. And don't yeah. complain about it. Like, he's nicer than that. But there's a couple scenes when he has to, like, decide he's going to be an authoritarian. And just, like, you do what I say now kind of thing. And it's it's a little weird how yeah, like, and like that the, used to be how it was. And the, there's um, two scenes where two different characters or two leads need to get um, letters of recommendation or are given letters of recommendation. And it's um, it's played off like it's uh, like it's such a big deal. And, you know, you get letters of recommendation if you're uh, if you work a salary job for 10 years or whatever. Uh, but these guys are both working retail like they're clerks. Right. And yeah. a letter of recommendation is like gold for them. Well, I mean, but I do know back in the day, letters of recommendation were, yeah, yeah. were given. And it it's was totally accurate. I'm, just, I'm saying that yeah. is what makes it feel dated. But it, it, it is weird. Like professionally, I've never needed to have a letter of recommendation. I needed a letter of recommendation. And I ended up not even having to use it for like school, like yeah. for a while. You need like to get into college if you're trying to go straight from high school. Yeah. Sometimes they'll get you. A, you need to get a letter of recommendation. But yeah, I've never really needed to have one. So yeah, that is interesting. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Uh, so to kind of get into the plot of this movie, uh, I, I did you feel any of the characters were uh, not? I think there were some likable characters, but did you think either of the leads were anything exceptional? Um, I remember thinking I watched You've Got Mail first and obviously I'm, I was very familiar with it I remember thinking when I was watching this that um, Clara who Meg Ryan sort of takes the place of uh, in, in You've Got Mail Meg Ryan's version is much better developed and I agree Clara is much more like one note I guess like she's got a, she's got a big mouth and she's cute I guess yeah I don't like her and I've been, this is coming from a salesperson, so I'm still in sales. Mm -hmm. I've been a sales manager. I have trained and led, at this point in my career, hundreds of different people throughout my career. And if she was my employee, I would trade her because she is shady. So, like, I had an employee um, who was very similar to her in terms of sales strategy where they flat out lie mm. and make shit up. Right, and we're talking about like, that scene where um, she's she hasn't she even gotten the job, job yet. She she asks she's asking Jimmy Stewart for the job, and he's telling her that the boss is going to tell her no, so it's not even worth trying. And then the boss comes out, and she sort of seizes on an opportunity to just jump in with a customer who was interested in a new item and talk to her as if she was a salesperson to uh, audition for the boss. And she basically she like does a super hard sell on the woman and like lies to her and like she. She kind of like pulls her aside, talks to her like girl to girl, and the woman's like a larger woman, and she's like, you know, I know it's like hard to n not eat sweets sometimes, and if you buy this musical box, then every time you reach for a candy, this music will play, and it'll sort of be like, don't eat that sweet, because you're going to get fat. But uh, bah, bah. You know what I'm yeah. saying, girlfriend? It's kind of like that. It Like, I think this scene was very effective. So, like, this is like the opening scene of the movie. Like, everybody's waiting for the boss to show up and get in, and then... They go in and the boss goes up to Jim Stewart, um, who plays Alfred Kralik, and he's like, hey, Jimmy Stewart, you're my number one sales guy. Do you think you could sell this box? And it's uh, it's supposed to be a cigarette box, and it plays um, uh, Ochi uh, Charnay. Yeah. And Just he's like, no, this is terrible. Like, no man is ever going to have that. How many cigarettes a day does the average man smoke? And the boss is like, I don't know, 20 to 40? And the guy's like, so 20 to 40 times a day they're going to hear this. Also, we're a leather goods shop and this is faux leather. This is garbage. So he says all these things and then the customer that you brought up points out all these things. She goes, eh, it's, it's an okay box. It's pretty, but that song is really annoying. Every time I open it, I'm going to hear this. And then the, the woman does change. Um, Clara, I thought that was a good sales technique. Like, oh, if you're going to use this for candy instead of cigarettes, yeah, it'll stop you from eating. 
but she lies about the 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 quality of the product. She says that they've sold dozens of them that day, and that's the last one. The boss says he's going to sell it for four dollars, and she sells. She goes, "Yeah, this is supposed to be six dollars, but I, it's on sale for five. So she sells like it for that. more. I like that. But that's incredibly dishonest. Well, like, I mean, you're not you're not wrong, but they didn't stock that thing yet. Like it was right. he, uh, the boss had like um, uh, a prototype, mo- not a prototype, like a, a tester a model, a sample. Thank you. That the uh, company had sent to him and he was deciding whether or not he wanted to buy a bunch of them to try and sell. So, but it ends up yeah, being I mean, a she plot definitely, line. She like definitely lied, but the boss could have made it any price he wanted. And she just sort of took some initiative to be like, right. I think we could sell it for more. Yeah. But she lied and said it's this price and that it's on sale. Which it wasn't. Like, none of what she said was true. So, like, yeah, the sale as a things. manager, if I saw that, because I had a salesperson who was very much like that, who wasn't a team player, did that. And even though he was the number one salesperson in the store that I was running or the department I was running in the store, I ended up trading him because I'm like, dude, you're going to fucking lie to my customers. You're going to get caught lying one of these days. And, and it's, it's gonna much worse nowadays ends. because there's Yelp. Yeah. So, the, yeah, exactly. One bad Yelp so, review. Yeah. No Yelp so and I, Hungry in 1940, like though. Yeah, I did not like her at all. And yeah. what's funny is, like, they, so the boss ends up buying a fuck ton of those boxes. And it's a plot line through the rest of the movie. Like, they have a display in the window, and they keep marking them down because they end up not being able to sell any additional boxes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like Jimmy Stewart was right, and he brought up these concerns. The customer brought up the concerns. Now, she was able to overcome the concern, which I do think was a good sales technique. Like, the one good thing I'd say was her saying, well, that's a good way to stop eating candy. I liked that. But other than that, terrible salesperson in terms of like integrity. I mean, that worked, but I think that is a one off. It's got a pretty high uh, rate of failure. Like, I don't think you should talk to your uh, customers about their weight. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) People are probably pretty sensitive about that. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, what else? I I liked that (laughs) scene because it set up a couple of things because the boss really wanted to sell it. Jimmy Stewart was like, no, this is dumb. And then this woman comes in, undermines the top salesperson who's also gunning for a promotion. Mm-hmm. And so it sets that in that antagonistic relationship. So I thought it was a really effective way to show all these relationships and how they're changing. Yeah. Economical but, uh, screenwriting. Yeah. It, it, I thought it was a good scene. I just didn't like her in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think that's maybe like her, one of her better scenes in the movie. I, I, I also, I do think it was a good acting scene. I just don't like that character for that. I think that, um, this character is also like, she's just mean. She's just kind of mean. That's just who the character is. Right. And we'll get to, you've got mail, but Meg Ryan, Meg Ryan's character is, um, like too sweet. She's too nice. To the yeah. point where she doesn't defend herself sometimes. So she ends up having this nice little arc where, well, I, we'll get to it. But yeah, she so, becomes meaner and then has to pull it back. So the guy, she, they end up getting the job. Um, the boss kind of, and Jimmy Stewart kind of argue about it. Because there's, there's another great kind of thing leading up to it where Jimmy Stewart, you mentioned, like says, I already know what the boss is going to say. He's going to say this, 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 this. But the boss happened to hear it. And we don't know why at this point. But the boss is starting to sour on Jimmy Stewart. So he... The boss is like, oh, what am I going to say? And so then, sure enough, he says all the things that Jimmy Stewart said he was going to say. And the boss is mad about it. He's like, dude, you really put me in a shitty situation. And Jimmy Stewart's like, dude, I told you. Like, you didn't have to do this. But, like, you just want to show me up for some reason. But I was right. And then she does the selling thing. And it, it works out. And they gets the job. But, yeah, she's antagonistic yeah. the entire movie. And the only time she's nice to him is... They're going to they're gonna meet each other. They're going to have a date a couple of weeks before Christmas and go to dinner. And the boss is like, we need to stay late and change the window display. And everybody needs to stay late. And so both Jimmy Stewart and um, Margaret Sullivan are like, no, boss, I need the day off. And uh, the boss is like, oh, we'll talk about it. So she goes and tries to sweet talk Jimmy Stewart and be like, oh, you're so good at merchandising you're so good at this and you've never tried to take advantage of me every other job i've gone to yeah, male sales people try to take advantage of me the compliment that she pays him is that he didn't try to feel her up in the back room yeah it's there's another you know timely thing i guess yeah like that actually doesn't date it that feels very relevant well it feels really but back in the day like people would you know slap a woman on the ass and be like good job attaboy like 
it yeah, was I totally mean, acceptable to do that back then, and like the woman would think, either just accept it and leave, and no, but like the man would never get in trouble for doing it. Right, and I think that that has not changed that much. Like a guy's probably not going to slap his coworker on the ass on the sales floor, but I guarantee you, ask any of your female friends, and yeah. they're going to tell you that one of their coworkers has tried to hit on them in the back room. Yeah, I guarantee that's still true. Yeah, men have yeah. a low bar. Yeah, yeah, they really do. Um, That's a, a good takeaway from both these movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the other kind of side characters in this movie, I can't remember what the character's name is, but he's like got this like sleazy. Uh, I think his name was like Vadas or something like that. But he's the like German this like guy? yeah, he's like this sleazy womanizing salesperson, and he like he's dressed all <laughs> dapper, he's dressed all nice. He's... Yeah, <laughs> and... I don't know if dapper is the word that I would use. <laughs> I know what word you're thinking, but he he's dapper and that, like okay, like maybe it's a 1940 thing, but that character's coded as gay, right? Oh, I would totally think so. If the I was I was so surprised. Of, yeah, I was so yeah. surprised that he's the one that's sleeping with the boss's wife. Yeah, yeah, and it's like uh, a song is in the trailer for this week. What did you just text me? Wait until after the episode. <laughs> Sorry. Why would you ask um, now? Because you texted me while we were recording. Yeah, I would tell you on air if it was important. <laughs> so yeah, this. So we find out that the boss hired a uh, private eye because he like saw a letter or something and found out that his wife was sleeping with one of his employees. So he just assumed it was Jimmy Stewart, but it turns out it was this uh, Vada guy. I don't blame him because Jimmy Stewart is very handsome. He's a swinging bachelor, and the only other eligible bachelor is clearly a gay person. So or the, yeah, like and that. then there's like the older family man. So it's like yeah. the only three male, or it could be the the minor errand Peppy. boy, which is the delivery man. So yeah, yeah. it's like if you're gonna guess, you're gonna guess Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, and this hey, guy's the, like the the boss looked like a Russian czar, right? Yeah, dude, he totally looked like uh, um, Kenneth Branagh in uh, Murder on the Orient Express. They had the same haircut. <laughs> <look at. laughs> what's, um, uh, what's Kenneth Branagh's name in that again? Ben, uh, I can never uh, say his name. Yeah, say, say his whole name. I can't remember his first name. <laughs> the first Hercules, but it's not pronounced Hercules. It's uh, Hercules Perot. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, but uh, yeah, this kid, this character's like coming up, like waving money. Everyone's like, "Hey, look at me with my money!" And like showing off his rings and everything throughout. Yeah. And then like you see her a couple different phone calls with the boss, and it's like, "Honey, I just gave you hella money. Where did this all go?" And then like the guy shows up, like waving cash around like oh guys sorry i didn't mean to show off my cash where do you guys think i got it and everyone's like we don't we don't care dude there's a nice moment with that guy where he arrives at work in front of everybody in a cab and then tips the cab driver with multiple bills we don't know what the bills are but multiple bills and then he's like flashing his money and then a moment later Excuse me, I just had some water. I'm like, I have the hiccups. And then a moment later, the um, the boss drives up, and you see him tip the cabbie, the cab that he took, and he gives him pennies. Like, you can see him pinching it. I thought that was uh, kind of a nice I moment. didn't notice that. That's good. Yeah. That's a good observation. I didn't notice that at all. So I didn't know they worked in a leather shop, so. <laughs> yeah, so eventually what ends up happening is everything kind of comes to a head um, when they decide they need this day off. So she goes to. For their date. Yeah, for their date. So. The delivery boy goes like, dude, I'm a, a minor. I can't stay that late. And Jimmy Stewart's like, dude, I'll figure it out with the boss. Like, you go home. You're a kid. Don't worry about it. And then Car uh, Clara shows up and she's like, hey, I saw that you gave the boy a day off. Like, is there any way you can swing it with me? And he's like, no, man. Like, if I have to be here, like, you're just going to have to cancel your date. Like, I have a date too, but I'm just going to have to cancel. I'm really sorry. It is what it is. Um, so she goes around him and goes to the boss. And the boss is like, yeah, you know what? You can take the day off. And Jimmy Stewart's like, whoa, bitch. <laughs> if anyone's getting the day off, it's me. I've been with you for nine years. I've never asked for a day off. And the boss is like, fuck you, man. You're going to work. <laughs> and Jimmy Stewart's like, dude, it's been nine years. And I've you never asked for a day You can work or you can go off. to war with Germany right now because I'm the czar of Russia. Yeah, idiot. <laughs> go, to war, go to war with Germany because Hungary yeah. is part of the Axis powers. So – Eventually what ends up happening is like they kind of fight about it and Jimmy Stewart's like, you know what? Like in front of everybody's like, you've been yelling at me a lot lately. You yelled at me at this day, this day, this day. My numbers are up. There's no reason for it. Like, what's the matter? And he's like, Well, maybe you should quit. And he's like, Maybe I will. And then like they 
cool off they go and then jimmy stewart comes back and he's like you know what i'm really sorry i shouldn't have yelled at you boss but you have been kind of angry and i just want to know why and he's like i have my reasons but i think you were right you should go and basically you'd, he gets fired you'd be happier somewhere else yeah so he gets fired he's like i'm not going to go on the date and he's telling the the family man guy like i'm not going to go on the date and the boss is so pissed he just sends everybody else home so he eventually goes on the date and the bo the family man's like um if you don't like clara you're not gonna like your date and he's like why it is your date and they have this like i thought this was a really great scene but they're in the diner and jimmy stewart shows up and he's like hey you know what's going on and she gets really mad she's like dude if my date sees you here he's gonna think i'm you know promiscuous or i'm with you like you need to go and he just keeps kind of like talking to her and he's actually being nice and she's like why do you hate me he's like he's, i don't hate you i mean he's been sort of nice but he's also like being very aggressive and um invading her like personal space like she asked right. him to leave and he just keeps on bothering her yeah that's fair uh but and at that point he knows he knows what he's doing too yeah that's fair uh and he does know but he does try to be like hey you know what like i no longer work there like maybe we should try to be friends and she's just like you're a worthless clerk and then like and you're bow-legged and he's like i'll fucking show you my legs i'll pull my trousers down outside right now when it turns out like apparently it took 48 takes for that line because like he got flustered because like the idea of showing his legs apparently uh jimmy stewart did not like his legs and he's like i don't want to show her my legs later because like it comes back around where he does ultimately show her the legs and he's like i really That's don't so want to show her my legs can we get a double and she's like i'm not doing this with a double just do it so he got all flustered and it took like 48 takes for him to get that well, line well, I, I don't know i don't, I don't want to show off my legs i had an accident <laughs> as a boy on my legs oh. shit was that jimmy stewart it's not no, exactly fucking it was mitch did mcconnell he, actually did we <laughs> They so, sound exactly alike. Like I was watching this movie and doing my Jimmy Stewart impression and I felt awful about it because it just sounds like Mitch McConnell. Wow. It does. Holy shit. <laughs> Especially if you watch like Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Like that's his most like Jimmy Stewart voice. And he's actually doing a filibuster. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so eventually this, this character is cool. So his name is um, Pepe. <laughs> he's the delivery guy and is it pepe the, or peppy it was pepe okay but he initially like you only see him on, and he's white you know, right? for, yeah yeah okay. but you you see him for like you know just a few seconds here and there throughout the movie and then all of a sudden his role completely changes and he becomes like the most interesting character in the entire movie yeah because he like shows up at the shop after hours and like he picks up the phone because the boss's wife wanted to get a hold of the kid because he was supposed well, to bring hold on. Her perfume. I think we're skipping over a big thing right here. Um you mentioned that the boss had a um a private eye following his wife because he suspected that she was cheating uh with Jimmy Stewart. So the private eye after Jimmy Stewart gets fired or is let go, the private eye shows up and reveals that he has information on who the boss's uh wife was cheating with, Manichek's wife. And um, it reveals that it is uh, Dapper Dan. Where, yeah, Dapper Dan. <laughs> and um, the boss is so distraught that he goes into his office and Pepe sort of checks in or like knows that he's there. They have a quick conversation and the boss goes to his office and Pepe like remembers that he has to ask him something or whatever and goes back to the office and catches the boss with a gun to his head and manages to grab him uh, just, like as he sh tries to shoot himself in the, the head. Trigger. So yeah. we actually hear a gunshot go off, and it's all and like off camera because it's 1940. Yeah, you, so you see the glass break, and Pepe is like, "Oh my god, no!" Uh, and then they cut to him like in the hospital, and then the yeah. next day when the wife calls and Pepe picks up the phone, she hasn't been made aware that her no, husband I'm not tried talking about that scene yet. Not not that oh. phone call. He talks to the wife a couple of times, so he picks up the Sorry. phone and like <laughs> disguises his voice because he was supposed to be out all day running errands, and clearly he like just went and played hooky to an extent because like he didn't drop off the shit that he was supposed to drop off at the, the house for the wife. So he like picks up the phone and pretends to be like a, some like female, like cleaner or something. He's like, hello. And she goes, <laughs> no, Pippi's not here, but uh, I'll let him know kind of thing. Um, and then like, yeah, the suicide, the attempted suicide scene comes up. And then the next day they're in the hospital and Jimmy Stewart's like, Hey, boss like i hope you're okay and the boss is like i told you you're gonna be promoted by christmas now i have to take time off i'm really sorry i should never have fired you 
the store is yours. Like I'll be the owner, but you're now the manager. You do whatever you want. Give yourself a raise. And then Pepe comes in and is like, hey, boss, I'm glad you're okay. And he's like, I can really – you're." I'm so thankful you're such a good kid. And he goes, oh, I'm just the lowly errand boy. It's There's nothing more I can do. And the guy's like, are you trying to strong arm me for a job? And he's like, I did just save your fucking life, you <laughs> old bitch. And so like, he gets promoted, and then he shows up to work the next day. And then I'll let you do the phone call because that's a pretty cool phone call. Oh, Don't you want to jump doing? the gun and talk about that phone call? I mean, I didn't. I, I think I kind of said what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I cut you off. But essentially, the wife calls in, and like the the boss tells Jimmy Stewart, like, I want you to fire Dapper Dan, but don't tell him it's because of the affair. Like, I'm bigger than that. You're bigger than that. We're not going to be petty. We're just going to say it's not working out, and we're not gonna we're not gonna bring up my wife's infidelity. But so Jimmy's like Jimmy Stewart's like that's cool. So Pepe shows up to work, and he's all dressed up in a nice suit and everything, and he calls like an ad agency. He's like. Hey, I need to hire an errand boy. And everyone's like, what the fuck are you doing, Pepe? And he's like, I'm the new salesperson or I'm the I'm, new clerk. I'm the salesperson now. <laughs> so then the wife calls and he's like, he like lowers his voice an octave and he's like, hey, missus. No, you're not getting that perfume. Why don't you ask Dapper Dan <laughs> to bring you the perfume? And then he hangs up and everybody looks at him. He's like, make what you will of that information. And just leaves like he does like a mic drop with an old school telephone. Yeah. And then he like hires like a new kid who's older Rudy. than him. Yeah. Because he's 15. He hires Rudy who's 17. <laughs> and he keeps calling him young man. <laughs> and like they end up getting their bonuses. And the boss is like, I haven't met you, but, you know, here's a bonus. And then uh, the kid's like, no, that's too much. Give some to your mom. <laughs> like the kid has no lines at the first half of the movie. And then all of a sudden becomes the coolest character in the movie. Uh, Pepe is Pepe's funny, man. He's kind of the MVP for me. No, he he was he gets all hilarious. the best lines. Hilarious. I I actually I genuinely thought the guy that played Manichek did a pretty good job too. He was. I think all the performances were solid. I thought this was a pretty good cast. Like it was. I I I can't I can't criticize anybody's performance in the movie or any of the characters. I thought for the most part the characters. None of them were, like, super fleshed out. Nobody went through really any arc in terms of, like, changing the character that they are, except for maybe the boss. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's a simple... This was based off a of play. There's, you know... And that's why there's only so many locations. It makes sense. But the rest of the plot kind of, like, picks up really fast. Uh, Jimmy Stewart mentions that he met the boyfriend, the pen, the pen pal, and he kind of like ribs uh, Clara a little bit and she's like, I'm going to give him the music box because he, in one of his letters, he mentioned that song and Jimmy Stewart's like, no, 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 don't, don't do the mail, the, the box. That's a terrible gift and tells her to get a wallet because he wants a wallet and he knows ultimately he's going to reveal himself, you know, on Christmas Eve. Yeah. And then, so she goes to the, the family man who's his friend is like, Hey, I'm going to get this guy at my pen pal a box. And, uh, the the friend is like, no, don't do the box. Get a get a wallet. And then he calls Jimmy Stewart. He's like, hey, bud, you're in the clear. You're gonna get a wallet. You're not gonna get that piece of shit music box. And then they have like the, the big reveal. Like he he ends up pulling a flower out of his like vest and puts it on. And they have this big reveal that it was them. And well, she mentions like, oh, I'm glad it was you because like you totally could have had me in the back room if you wanted me earlier. Yeah, I think you're kind of glossing over how that how the conversation went before that though. Like I feel like it's worse in the in You've Got Mail, but Jimmy Stewart is like is he really toying with her. Oh, that's right cuz he was like, "Yeah, I met the guy. He's bald and he's fat and he's got no job." Yeah. And she's like, "I had no idea. Oh, he's taking it. but she can't say that. Like he's like, "He never told me he didn't have a job." There are a couple different kind of uh risque lines during these talks there's a point when she's like oh you know i i always was like barking at you but in reality i wanted you to lick my paw or i wanted to lick your paw or whatever i'm like damn she wants to lick him okay <laughs> and then like he when she gets like the last letter like he gives her like the letter on the um, the envelope says open me up and give me a kiss and i just <laughs> like oh my god so he's not circumcised okay <laughs> jesus christ that's not what i got from that but all right <laughs> Katrina and I both thought we looked at each other because it's like first she says like she wants to lick his paw and then he's like open me up and give me a kiss <laughs> like 
I think he's referring to the letter being opened he up. He is. I'm just making it dirty. <laughs> um, yeah. And man. then he reveals his legs to show he's not bow legged. Yeah. That was such a weird moment in, in this whole thing because the the like visual language of the entire movie is mm-hmm. like uh, medium wide shots. Like everybody is being shot from the waist up and mm-hmm. occasional close up. And then all of a sudden we have a shot of people's legs. Yeah. It's super it's weird. Like, yeah. It's, it's like very jarring. And then it fades to black. They're like, oh, yay, we're together. Yeah. But it's, um, it's a fun movie. I, like the, yeah, I had a good time with it. The not, dialogue is snappy. Not amazing. Not a classic, but yeah. had a good time. But I, I the thought the dialogue, dialogue overall was, was snappy. Like, the chemistry between between the two leads was really good. And, you know, they, they only had two or three real long scenes where they had, you know, a, a pretty good back and forth. But, it was, you know, the, the back room when she's trying to butter him up and be like, you never took advantage of me. You're a good guy. And he calls her out like, you're just being sweet on me, so I'll give you the day off. But, like, mm-hmm. they're back and forth there. They're back and forth in the diner. Like, the the, the timing was great. And I think with, with banter like that, it's all about the timing. And I think they they had that down. Everything landed in a, in a natural way. So yeah. I thought it was fun. Like, for a 40s movie, I thought it was pretty good. I don't – I used to not like these old movies, but I – I thought this one was pretty easy to watch. It, you know, there's the thing about older movies like this where they don't get as like packed full of uh, story as um, movies in the last, you know, 30 years after the seventies, I guess. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like it's just easier to like sit down with one of those movies and hang out or watch yeah. it with somebody and not worry that you're missing some, missing something. So I feel like the, the mood um, up, up until the seventies or so was kind of, go to the theater and maybe you arrive a little late. You're not worried about missing too much plot. And like you can hang out your neck with your best girl or whatever. It's a, much more <laughs> like, it's a casual experience. It's more of a pastime. It's less about like, Oh, what did, what did uh, Kenneth Branagh say in reverse in Estonian and how, what character is moving forward through time, which one's moving back. And, you know, or even can... like the Marvel movies, like people sit and they feel they have to watch every second because they know there's going to be 20 Easter eggs in the movie. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about WandaVision every week, and, like, I'm watching all of those YouTube videos where the next day, or even, like, within an hour, somebody is uh, put up, puts up a video listing all the Easter eggs from this week, and I was like, fuck, like, I had one conversation during this episode, and I didn't realize that Agnes's fucking brooch is, you know, three chihuahuas or whatever it is. Yeah, no, I, it's, it, it is pretty crazy, like, it's, it's great now, because there's so much you can unpack, and you can get a lot more like an hour of television, you can get a lot more out of that hour um, in terms of conversation. But yeah, you there's like they, there was a study a couple years back that like the the most one of the most anxiety driven things that happens to a person is being recommended a new show or movie because there's so <laughs> much content out there that people yeah. and you don't want to alienate your friends and be like, well, I didn't watch this thing that you recommended. But it's like, dude, yeah. there's no fucking time to watch it. There are dozens of shows that I've been dying to watch that I just haven't got to so i yeah i it is kind of nice to go back and watch one of these simple things yeah it's it's um um type of experience yeah the tempo is just slower it's It's easy to yeah you're just you're just hanging out and enjoying it and i think you talk about the um the actors chemistry with each other and it's more about just like enjoying how these two people relate to each other and not what the machinations of the fucking story are and I think we will definitely get into it in the new one. But what I like about this era of movies is you see a lot of the same actors paired together over and over and over mm-hmm. again. Part of it is because of the way the studios work. The studios essentially owned the actors. Well, in retrospect, part of it is also because there wasn't a home video market. So the only time yeah. that you can see these movies is in the theater. So if you like the way two people act together, the only way you're going to see them together again is if a new movie comes out. You're not yeah. going to be able to rewatch Shop Around the Corner. Yeah. But yeah, you'd have the same people, and as we get into the new one, like that, the one that we're watching, um, you've got mail. It's the third romantic comedy that Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks were in together. So, um, I thought that was an interesting parallel. But uh, I do have to ask, what have you been up to, bud? Oh man, I I I wasn't prepared because I wanted to mention one more thing about this movie. Oh, mention it. I know we're we're sort of running longer than we meant to, um, but I thought it was worth pointing out that this movie uh, takes place. Well, it was released in 1940, and I'm assuming it took place in 1940, right? I would say probably. So 1940 in Hungary 
was wartime. Like they were in World War II yeah. as part of uh, their allies with Italy and Japan and the Nazis. Yeah, so that's interesting. It, it was very strange to me to be watching this movie and like what and they're all they're all Americans too. The best friend is doesn't seem like he's American, but he's speaking English, but and well, his name is Petrovic, so he probably was Eastern European. Yeah, but like Jimmy Stewart's white. Clara is – she's maybe like German. She spells her name with a K, and she's, you know, white and blonde. Uh, Pepe um, seems like an American teenager, weirdly. Yeah. And um, the Dapper Dapper Dan um, – it, like it looks like a German dude. He looks like yeah. It looks like a, he like an aristocrat or something. But he's definitely blonde. It, it, it was doesn't just make very sense. Strange. It's I was just like, where are all the Hungarian people? It's it's based off the play. Well, the thing that's interesting is all the stuff, all the signage in the movie. Everything is mm -hmm. in Hungarian except for the sign for the clearance that changes throughout the movie to show that those boxes are on clearance because they couldn't sell any more of them. Sell any more of them. That signs in English because the director thought it was important to the plot to have that one sign in English. But apparently, the rest of the signs uh, and everything else that's printed, other than the um, the store's name, is in uh, Hungarian. Yeah. So. All right. Um, yeah. What have you been up to, man? Yeah, dude. I rewatched Mars Attacks. That is just a fantastic movie. I haven't watched it in a long time, but I remember it's it, so that good. came out. You know, that and Men in Black came out within a year of each other. Mm -hmm. And people liked Men in Black more at the time than than Mars Attacks. I mean, you know, they're they're very different movies. Um, they are. I think Mars Attacks has more uh, replay value. You know, tw uh, twenty twenty years on, twenty five years on. I feel like I would like it more now than I did the last time I watched it, which was when I was in like high school. Yeah, I think it's um, it's similar to like Starship Troopers and Showgirls, uh, in in the sense that people didn't understand how much of a satire it was or like what exactly it was doing. Nobody knows the Starship Troopers is a, is a satire. That's it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy. All of his movies well, are satire. I think every single one, even more so showgirls, like people think showgirls yeah. is taking itself very seriously. I'm like, no, that's all a joke. Like it's no. funny. It Everything funny. he does is, a, is, is very heavy handed satire, yeah. which is insane that people don't see it. Oh, uh, we watched um, very Harold and Kumar Christmas. Speaking of NPH, oh nice, and they reference uh, Starship Troopers in that. No, that's funny. <laughs> that's so good, man. Um, we watched. Uh, we actually watched all three Harold and Kumars um, late last month, but I, I didn't mention it last time we. Uh, that's what we I do with the Fifth Amendment. Why is your ass so full of shit? <laughs> <laughs> Real men don't go between the cheeks. <laughs> um, I watched a Fat Wreck, which is the documentary about uh, the record label Fat Records. Okay, cool. And uh, focuses on Fat Mike, obviously. That was pretty cool. Um, my homie Ben is in that. So it was cool to see him. Uh, I watched Avengers Age of Ultron. We talked about that. I've been watching WandaVision, obviously. I've rewatched all of those episodes. Um, I've watched two them all three twice times so now. far. Yeah, I watched the first two, three times, I think. Maybe the first three. Uh, but this last episode was fucking bananas. Bonkers. Who do you think is going to... We know we're getting at least one big cameo. Who do you think it's going to be? What uh, the internet knows is that Paul Bettany said that he worked with somebody that he hasn't worked with yet that he was very excited about, which sounds like it might be Benedict Cumberbatch. And um, oh yeah, I they said Liz, that Lizzie Olsen today said that uh, there's a really big surprise coming that nobody has any idea about. Oh, I have no like, idea. Uh, I haven't. She seen said that she likened it to Luke Skywalker in The Mandalorian. Oh damn! Yeah. So I think the things that are floating around are definitely Doctor Strange, and especially because this leads into Multiverse of Madness. Um, They've pretty but that much doesn't... confirmed he'll be in the last episode. I, I would be yeah. shocked if he wasn't. I think, I think that's who Paul Bettany's talking about, but that doesn't sound like a Luke Mandalorian level thing. That no. doesn't sound like the same thing to me. Um, that sounds like it would be like Cap or Tony, but I don't think it's I think it's, it's going to be the two versions of Quicksilver. I think it's yeah. going to be Aaron Taylor Johnson and... Um, I can't remember his name right now, but the kid from Evan Peters. the Fox. Yes, Evan Peters. And then, you know, Magneto is also a thing, but I don't think that they would cast Magneto. Who knows? Um, like, they might. Like, Yeah, I mean, that would be a huge reveal. Yeah. Generally, Marvel doesn't, because they would have to cast a huge name for Magneto, right? That's yeah. not going to be a nobody. And it would be crazy for them to keep that under wraps and then reveal it at the end of this show when they haven't even introduced uh, mutants yet. We'll see. I don't know. I I do think it. it I, I think 
there's no way that that Doc Strange doesn't show up. Um, he definitely is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, think I think you're right about Quicksilver's. I think both of them will be in it. I think both Quicksilver's are going to show up, and then um, I think by the end of this, there I think we'll get a post credit scene on the last episode, and I think that might be a Spider Man trailer. And I don't remember if I mentioned this in the bonus episode, but my new theory. And I haven't read this anywhere else, but I still think Mephisto is going to be a big part of this. And I think that Spider-Man 3, hot take, it's going to be like a riff of uh, It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> where I like that. He's going to wish that he wasn't Spider-Man. And he's going to get found guilty or something like that. He's going to be on trial and he's going to be like, I wish I was never Spider-Man. And then he's going and to check out Toby and Andrew. He's going to make a deal with uh, Mephisto. And then Doc Strange is going to be like, no, 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 Mephisto. I give me a minute to to haul out my boy, and he's going to take him <laughs> on a journey through the multiverse and be like, "Spider Man's pretty rad." I love that. Um, uh, my, yeah. I have a hot take about Wanda. I don't think Mephisto is going to be in it at all. Mm. I think at best he is name dropped at the end, the way that Thanos is in the original Avengers. But I think he's that's the possible. man behind the curtain that we'll hear about later. But I don't think that he's anything more than like in the distant um you know pulling pulling strings i think that's plausible i do think the uh is it dotty the was it dot yeah the blonde yeah. um her and um katherine han's character are the only ones that we saw that didn't get names of real world things yeah. so i i think she's going to be a pretty big character of some kind i saw a few she was, she was also in buffy like she's um She's an experienced genre TV person, so I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if they are using her in some way. She's got her be um, her husband is I forget the name now, but her husband is um is a real person in the MCU too. Yeah, and that that might just be like an Easter egg. Just like oh yeah, these these characters exist, but they're not superheroes yet, or yeah. they won't be. But just so you you know, just just something for fun. Ooh. I think um yeah, I think Agatha Harkness is going to be Catherine Hahn. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely Catherine Hahn. Like, yeah. Agnes is at Agatha Harkness. Yeah. I think she's going to be a bigger bad than some pe- than the people who think that Mephisto is the big bad are thinking. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think she's a bigger deal than that. But I, I do think Mephisto, I, I think you're probably right that it'll be, he'll be I the one pulling the strings over the three different stories. I was just thinking about how many episodes are left. There's five um, left and how much heavy lifting they have to do in those episodes and i don't think there's space for them to introduce uh a essentially judeo-christian character which is something we've never seen in the in the mcu That's and fair. who's also like the devil like it's it's such a big thing and it requires so much um it has so much baggage with it that i just yeah. don't see it happening in five episodes we'll see who knows yeah who i'm knows? fucking in for it man I'm, I'm enjoying this ride so much so i'm just gonna shotgun most of what I watched um, really quickly. So I got a new TV last weekend, and uh, it's it's a 4K HDR Dolby Vision. So I wanted to just kind of go through a bunch of content like that and see how nice my new TV looks like. So over the weekend, I just watched bits and pieces of uh, Tenet, um, Spider-Man Far From Home, Infinity War. I did re-watch. The, I watched uh, Far From Home too. That was my last one. Oh, was it? Yeah, I only watched yeah. a couple of scenes. I watched the 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 scene in Venice when the, the Hydro Man comes, um, and then I rewatched uh, the tragedy episode of The Mandalorian, the one where uh, Boba Fett just fucking kicks all kinds of ass, and um, started watching Daredevil season three again. I've already seen it, but Katrina hadn't seen it, so I forced her to watch it because that's also a, a Dolby Vision show on Netflix. So started nice. to do that. And then in terms of movies, uh, we watched Promising Young Woman, which was oh, yeah. uh, really good. I, I kind of guessed the ending in the first five minutes of the movie. Still um, haven't seen it. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, but it's good. It's, it's good, and it's, I think it's actually a very important movie to show people what women go through all the goddamn time. Um, it's like really good. felt up in the back room of a retail store. Yeah. But no, it's, it's really good. Highly recommend it. Um, we also watched the personal history of David Copperfield. Hmm. It's weird. Like it's it's it was good. I wouldn't say it's great. Like it's got a, all kinds of Oscar buzz, and it does some interesting things visually. And it has like these weird, where it has like a straight linear story, but then it also has these like weird kind of vignettes where they're like experiencing other things at the same time as he's telling the story. So it's like you're seeing the story unfold but there's also points where he's narrating the story to an audience 
and mm. he's got like props and everything and then the props turn into characters but then they turn back it's it's weird it's interesting i i don't think it's best picture material but it was worth watching Tight. and i think that's oh and we finished i love lucy so we started watching the uh, golden girls nice um can i make a recommendation for your 4k sure check out the slow-mo guys on youtube oh Ooh. i've yeah. been watching a lot of random nature documentaries too on there but i can't remember any of them so i didn't mention them the slow-mo guys have been doing they you know they get their hands on a phantom 4k and they, they i think they were like around i think they've been around for like 10 years or something and they um they just cornered the fucking slow motion market and they do shit like shooting uh you know a bear at 50 cal through a watermelon kind of stuff nice um, all these like big crazy um you know quasi experiments and they film everything in slow-mo and then you get to just like uh watch this shit at 150,000 frames per second I and it's love incredible that shit. and a bunch of them are in 4k and i just got 4k monitors for my new computer and i was doing the same thing i was like let me watch some stuff that's in 4k and it looks incredible i uh i've been really into uh on on facebook i'm sure they're on youtube as well but it's called like how ridiculous and it's these australian guys and somehow they have access to a dam in australia that's hundreds and hundreds of meters tall and then they also have this random tower that they just have access to that's like 60 meters tall and yeah. they just drop shit off of it and see <laughs> how things break oh, yeah. but like they drop like things that are hundreds of pounds and they've dropped safes and cars and boats and shit like that and it's uh it's fun how ridiculous that's the best man pitch pitch me the remake man you've got mail um, why should i make this movie what's it about Okay, so you know um, that movie from uh, that was set in Hungary, uh, Shop Around the Corner, with Jimmy Stewart and what's her face? Yeah, yeah, he kind of sounds like Mitch McConnell. We're gonna do, we're gonna redo that with our uh, with our dynamic duo, uh, Tommy Hanks and Maggie Ryan, and um, we're gonna make it a little bit better in some places and a little bit creepier in other places, but we'll be able to uh, s uh, sell DVDs, and we're gonna make a ton of money. And money, 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 money. Nice. Tom Hanks, America's dad. He's fucking great. America's dad. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is this is like a remake, but sort of with a little gentrification twist and uh, much yeah. more of a focus on on our lead couple and less of like an ensemble thing. Um, and I think it was like, like I said, it's it's better in some places. I think the characters are a little bit more developed. I think the story is a little bit more focused. It doesn't feel as claustrophobic. Um, it doesn't feel like a play, even though it's you know based yeah. on one. Um, and like Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan are great. They have chemistry. Uh, Meg Ryan has more of an arc, and they're as but as charming as both of them are, the like the weird aggressiveness that. Um, that both characters in the original had is like kind of amplified in this, or at least in Tom Hanks's character. Yeah. There's a lot of scenes in this that feel very like um, aggressive and, and invasive to me. And the only reason that it works is because, um, because it's the Tom two Hanks. leads, because the two leads are our parents, essentially yeah. America's it, parents. And I, and I, I don't disagree with that assessment. Um, I, that's never dawned on me, but like, it is very much a product of its time. Like in the late nineties, like, all your male leads were these very successful businessmen who put business first, who were deep down good guys, but they were business people. And it was like, they really hammered home. It's nothing personal. It's nothing personal. These guys are all Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what you got to keep in mind. Like we yeah. watch a lot of these movies and we have, you know, nostalgia for them and blah, blah, blah. But looking back on it now, it's like, you guys are all Republicans. And I would not get along with you if we met. In yeah. Well, to kind of bring up your point of gentrification, like, uh, the Fox books, like the, the general premise of the movie is the same. There are people who have an antagonistic relationship who are secretly friends. Instead of pen pals, they are email pals. And instead of just being competing salespeople in the same shop, um, one is a small business owner and one is, you know, a big, you know, Fortune 500 company who's trying to put them out of, mar out of business. Right. And which, by the way, I think that's an improvement on the original movie. Like, I think that's a way more uh, dramatically rich uh, premise. I think so, too. Two people at the same shop. And one of the other things that I think is interesting is, in a way, even though this is really dated with AOL, you've got mail. Like, nobody, uh, you know, under 65 uses AOL anymore. But everybody used AOL. But this is still kind of timeless in that you mentioned gentrification, you know. 
everybody's seen that we're talking about it all the time and then you look at like what amazon's doing like you could just substitute this and make tom hanks jeff bezos and well meg ryan literally any business owner well what's funny about this is uh fox books tom hanks's company is essentially barnes and noble right yeah. but now barnes and noble's going out of business so if you remade it today uh, Tom Hanks would be the underdog and Jeff Bezos and Amazon yeah. would be his character. And Je and Amazon started as a book company. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah, so. it, it was it was wild watching this and thinking like, oh yeah, Fox Books is just like Barnes and Noble, Barnes and, and Noble Borders like and all business. those things. Yeah. Yeah. Which all the none books. of these exist. Like yeah. I fucking loved Borders. I used to hang out at Borders all the Hell time yeah. when I was younger. Oh yeah. Um I liked hanging out at these big bookstores. I still will periodically <laughs> just go to Barnes and Noble and walk around and pick up a book and read it for half an hour uh, yeah so it's like i get I it to, in the before times i would go to the grove and uh, go to barnes and noble that was like the one of the few places at the grove that i actually walked inside of and i was yeah, just like me i too. like books i like being around books other than the the theater and I only went, i've only been to the yeah i've only been to um the movies there like two or three times I've, I've sat down and had a drink in the bar more times than i've seen a movie at the i grove. i we used to go to that one all the time when um before AMC A list, uh, when it was mo when Movie Pass, we would go there because we lived in Crenshaw, and the theater in Crenshaw, unfortunately, wasn't very nice. Um, so we would drive the ten extra minutes and go either to Studio City, um, and go to the AMC there, not Studio City, uh, Century City, or we would go to the Grove, and We're we really liked the Grove. In and Century City. I had a. There were a couple bartenders there that like I just chatted up about music once. So I used to get free popcorn coupons a lot at the uh, nice. the theater there. But uh, popcorn's tight. Yeah, um, you know to bring up like you mentioned the Republicans. Like pretty early in the movie, there's a scene where where Tom Hanks is in a business meeting with his dad and some you know trusted old school employee who's you know you could very well believe that that is the grandfather. Was that the grandfather? Yeah, it's three okay. generations. So it's three Fox. generations of foxes, and they joke about like, "Oh, did you, you know, so and so books went out of business?" And they're like, "Oh, what a shame!" And then they all kind of like do finger guns at each other, and like, eh, yeah. another one bites the dust. Yeah, and then it's you Gordon, just talk about how it's they, Gordon Gecko, but he likes the Beatles. Yeah, and it's just like they gut, they talk about how they gutted it, and then they literally talk about they're like, "It's all good. We've got the new store that's gonna open up on the west side." We're going to get all these pseudo, they say this, pseudo liberal intellectuals who will sit around and drink coffee and, and read poetry kind of thing. And it's just like, yep. Yeah. Yeah. He's talking about me. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> um, another thing that is similar to this, but not exactly the same thing. Oh, well, actually, let me back up for a second. Greg Kinnear is playing Meg Ryan's boyfriend. This is going to be a nice segue into my other point. Greg Kinnear is playing Meg Ryan's boyfriend and at the beginning of the movie and um that dude feels like a republican to me too and he's no. i mean he's like a pretend he's like a pretentious fucking writer he's up his own ass with uh his like columns and he's like clearly ready to cheat on meg ryan at the drop of a hat you don't think that guy's a republican I no think i think he's like super i think he's super liberal but to like i think he's like a liberal like if you maybe look at, maybe he's a neoliberal yeah like if you look at like how liz lemon which is basically uh, republican in 30 rock how she started like early liz lemon was very competent and she was liberal and she knew what she was talking about. But towards the end of 30 Rock, she was like a, a joke liberal where she was just like, mm -hmm. I'm angry about this, but didn't know anything. I kind of felt like that's what Greg Kinnear was, was like super liberal, but doesn't really know what he's talking about because he has this. Yeah. like, I, I think he's like uh, Bill Clinton, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton brand of liberal, which is like is more like a 70s, 80s Republican. Yeah, I feel like he's probably a little bit more liberal than that. But I also feel like he starts like his first scene is him like bashing technology. He doesn't like computers. They're impersonal. And like he gets a typewriter and he makes all these things like he has. He says it twice in the movie where he's like the VCR was made so you can not miss TV when you go out. But the whole point of going out is to miss what's on TV. Kind of thing. Like he's one of those like pseudo intellectuals, which is what, you know, the dad yeah. said. Um, right, right. I feel like well, it, it, I was gonna say I feel like if he was still around, that character is somebody who would like make a podcast where he's like, I'm fighting for the underdog, even though he doesn't like technology. But he'd be like, it's he, the radio, it's the golden era of radio, and I'm fighting for the underdog, getting a voice for them. I feel like he's one of those people. I think you're right, and actually, that uh, I feel like that. Um kind of proves my point i think he feels like dennis miller or bill maher 
at that time and both of those dudes have become big republican well bill maher's not a republican but they've become like more conservative as they've gotten older. bill maher stands for nothing <laughs> like i mean he contradicts I say, himself all the goddamn time he's That's a piece a, of shit yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I bring up Greg Kinnear as the boyfriend because this movie also begins with both of our leads having emotional affairs with what appear yep. to be doting, loving partners. And uh, that rubbed me the wrong way for the first 30 minutes or so of this movie. You know what else makes me – rubs me the wrong way about that? Hmm. So if you look at a couple of movies – so um, when I when I suggested this, you were like, oh, why don't we do Sleepless in Seattle in this? And I'm like, well, they're not remakes, and this is actually a remake of The Shop Around the Corner. And you're like, oh, shit, I had no idea. But in that movie, which is another big Meg Ryan movie with, with Tom Hanks, same thing. Now, Tom Hanks is a widower in that movie. Right. She has this emotional relationship with somebody she hasn't even met. Like, she just heard about this guy on a radio. And she's got Bill Pullman in Sleepless in Seattle, who is super doting, super loving. And she finally is like, I've been having an emotional affair, and I'm going to go meet him on the top of the Empire State Building. And he's just like, that's great. You go cheat on me. Like, I, it's totally cool that, you know, we're engaged and you've been having an emotional affair, but I want you to be happy. And this one, it's the same thing. Like, Greg Kinnear, Greg Kinnear was, yeah. like, flirting with the TV, and he lets her know, and she's like, it's totally cool. I was emotionally cheating on you as well. Like, she gets off in two movies being a terrible person <laughs> cheating, and in real life, she was a cheater. She cheated on Dennis Quaid with Russell Crowe. <laughs> and, like, you another bitch. thing... There's there's a not terribly different version of this where they have that conversation where it's like played for a laugh that they've both been like over the relationship or whatever. And that shit happens and if you know you it's like natural or whatever. Coladas. But the issue with that in this movie is that the first scene of the movie is her in what's his apartment, but they play it like it's their shared apartment and they're just like they're acting like they're married essentially. Yeah. So it feels like they're trying to sell us on this couple who is um you know, has been together forever and is like super comfortable with each other. They they are married or are close to it. And then towards the middle of the movie, they're both like, I've been, you know, we've neither one of us has been in this for a lot. For and a, they joke a, about a it. They're like, time. we're perfect together. Like they, they name all these things like you believe in this. I believe in this. We like this. We like this. We go together here. We like all the same things. We're really perfect together. But why doesn't this work? I don't know. Like it really yeah. is like. Like if the Pina Colada song, the escape song, just ended with them going like, hey, we were both about to cheat on each other. It's kind of funny. Let's just call it yeah, a day. high five. Yeah. yeah. Like it's a little weird. And Tom Here's Hanks another is in thing a relationship about... with Parker Posey. Sorry, yeah. Which, again, she's like the first scene in the movie. She's a little like um, – ditzy is not the right word. I'd say like she's immature. I'm, I mean, I mean, I'm trying to say it like in a charming way because she, she's like playful and fun. She's like giving him a kiss, and she's like a little bit of a space cadet, but she clearly like she's loves aloof. him very much. Yeah. And then later in the movie, they're kind of like, well, no, she actually like is, is a bitch. Um, yeah, is, is a total asshole. And they have that scene in the uh, in the elevator. Uh, yeah, she, I didn't... He, She's like, yeah, I don't actually like. She cuts him off. She's like, yeah, I don't care about what this guy has to say. Yeah, and then she's like rude. To, like they're trapped in the elevator. She's rude to the people that are in there and. Like yeah. he start like she's like oh I'm this is so traumatizing because of this and then yeah Tom Hanks goes to say something like what he's struggling about and she just interrupts and is like I don't remember was like oh where are my Tic Tacs or whatever it was so she yeah. was just like I actually hate when movies do that like I was watching I've been watching Scrubs and Zach Braff's character is the main character and for three seasons he's portrayed as this really great guy and you know he's immature but like he's a good dude and then uh, the twist at the end of season three is he gets the romantic lead throughout the whole series to dump her boyfriend for him. And like that same episode, a character goes, Oh, you don't actually love her. You just want what you can't have. That's classic JD. And then he gets the girl. And then like, as soon as she kisses him, he's like, Oh my God, I don't want her. And that pissed me off. Cause I'm like for three seasons, he's wanted nothing but her. He sabotaged yeah. other relationships for her. Clearly yeah. he wants her. And then one line of dialogue, all of a sudden he's this immature asshole who wants what he doesn't want. Yeah, it's just when like can, when it's have. convenient for the story. Yeah, I hate when characters just change like that abruptly. Like, um, another thing that uh, made me hate Meg Ryan is that she, like, a little girl sneezes early in the movie, and she pulls out her handkerchief and gives it to the girl. She shares hankies. That's how you get COVID. That is, that is a sick person, and I would have been against it before COVID, but even uh, now, it's even more. Um, 
Is this another thing? And she like- literally says, the little girl's like, what's a handkerchief? She's like, you know what a handkerchief is? A handkerchief is like a tissue that you don't throw away. <gasps> Well, what you're supposed to do is for a man, like a woman, if they have a handkerchief, they're supposed to keep it. A man is supposed to carry two, one in their breast pockets for them. And then one in their other pocket is for her. But yeah, you don't give a child your handkerchief. That's weird. You don't give, I mean, I don't think you give anybody your handkerchief. No, that's, that's like, disgusting. that was a thing back in the day. Like Jimmy, the, the, sure, Jimmy the guy, one, yeah. guy has one to give away. That's exactly. like a clean one, yeah. but yeah, he's not going to give, he's, he's not going to give his girlfriend or the, a woman or whatever, like a used one exactly yeah he's got a clean one ready that's cool that's fine so (laughs) (laughs) so to get back into this this movie a little bit they like they have commentary about starbucks you know like starbucks is a way to have somebody who can't make a decision make 20 decisions in six seconds or whatever it is lots of you know this movie came out the same year as fight club i think fight club was 98 or 99 i can't remember um yeah but same thing commentary about starbucks i thought was kind of interesting Mm-hmm. Um, I liked the the rent control thing. Like Steve Zahn has a six room house for four hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. By the way, Steve Zahn and Tom Hanks reunited after that thing you do. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah baby. Yeah, I need to watch that. I, I it's, it's so on good. my list to watch. We let's let's find a way to do that on this. I'm definitely gonna do it. We're gonna we've been talking about doing it on Room My Childhood. Like we're still on a hiatus mm-hmm. for that with everything going on, but uh, eventually well, we're gonna I'll bring it back. On that one. But you could guess on that when we cover it. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Um, but sorry, I'm, I'm totally interrupting you, but I just remembered they have that scene in the movie theater where they essentially break up and she tells him that she didn't vote in the last election. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they mentioned Giuliani. Yeah. Yeah. This was when he was still like America's mayor just before 9-11. Yeah. I'd have to I'd have to go back and look. But I think uh, the implication was that he voted for Giuliani. Yeah, but everybody voted for Giuliani for a while. Like he was America's mayor, like Republic. He was moderate Republicans and Democrats liked him. I'm telling you, man, all these people are fucking Reagan Republicans. So, does it get back in the movie a little bit? Like, she, <laughs> they're opening up a big box store, and everyone's right. like, oh, Meg Ryan, your store's going to close. And she's like, no, we're going to like do guerrilla marketing and we're going to keep open. And they run into each other at this party. And she's like, hey, you're putting me out of, you know, I'm your competitor. And he's like, you're not my competitor. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, and you just like, you, you probably do X amount of money. You sell this many books in a month. Boom, boom, boom. You have this much overhead. Like you're, you're nothing to me. Like, don't, don't fucking act like you're, you're something. You're, you're a piece of shit kind of thing. And then he like eats all the caviar. He doesn't tell her that she's a piece of shit. He basically but... says that he's like, you're nothing. You're not worth my attention. Don't try to act like we're equals. And this is a big catalyst because you mentioned like her arc is that she's very timid and like wants to save her business, but isn't doesn't know what to do and isn't willing to play dirty. So she in an email is like, hey, this asshole is trying to put me out of business is like saying this. And he happened to quote the Godfather at the party. And she's like, yeah, you mentioned the Godfather. And obviously it's the same person. Tom Hanks is both people in her life. And he's like, dude, the Godfather's the shit. And then she's like. You got to go to the, you know, take it to the mattresses, go to war. And then she slowly becomes more aggressive. And one of my favorite scenes in this movie, she's on the news and she's like, yeah, big box businesses. They're putting, you know, the little guy out of business. They suck. Don't go to that store. And Dave Chappelle's in this movie. And the only reason he's in this was he was supposed to be Bubba in Forrest Gump, but he turned it down because he didn't think the script was good and he regretted it. And so Tom Hanks is like, hey, if I ever have anything that makes sense, I'll get you in it. So he, Tom Hanks asked Nora Ephron to give their role to to uh, Dave Chappelle. But they're at the gym and they're watching this news. Uh, and by the way, Dave Chappelle is playing the um, the family man character from the original. Yeah. And that dude is like the only person of color in that movie. Yeah. Dave Chappelle in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Little pigeonhole. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So they're watching the news on the gym. Yeah. At the gym. And they give this like whole segment to Meg Ryan and then it switches over to like the news anchor interviewing Tom Hanks and Tom Hanks is like, Oh, don't watch this. Like I, I'm going to spin this and people are going to love me. And it's just like, I, I sell cheap books, stuff. sue me. And <laughs> Dave Chappelle's like, Oh yeah, that was good. And he's like, no, I talked about how like we've got X amount of books and coffee and you can read for hours and no one's going to bother you. And he's like, I was eloquent. Shit. <laughs> I think that's such a good line. There's a lot of really good dialogue in this movie. Yeah, it's snappy. Like, like Dora well Ephron writes good movie, like good dialogue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a little thing with Nora Ephron. So she wrote this with her like 
sister and her parents wrote um one of like the one of the other remakes of this like the the musical version they did a player version of it or whatever but she says yes this definitely plays homage to the shop around the corner which is the name of meg ryan's bookstore but she says she feels that this is more of a remake of pride and prejudice than a shop oh, around the corner. and they talk about that in the in the movie yeah, they talk yeah, about, pride and, a a about pride and prejudice a lot and now that i think about it you really could look at meg ryan as elizabeth bennett and tom hanks as darcy um the only difference is darcy behind the scenes was actually doing a lot of good um, for the Bennett family in this he still put her out of business so but yeah there are a lot of parallels to to uh Pride and Prejudice yeah and and on the other side of it this movie um you know obviously it takes the the main premise from Shop Around the Corner it's very clearly an homage and then the diner scene where Dave Chappelle and the family dude from the previous movie it's almost word for word the same it's word for word shot for shot almost the same like 95 percent yeah even to the point where um, when he goes inside the diner, he turns left to get to her table. Like geographically, it's very similar. Um, yeah, yeah, it really yeah. is. So I, I, when I watched the, 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 the first movie, watched it second, um, and that scene came up, I was like, oh my God, this is exactly the same. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, it really is. And like I think, that scene... and I think it's like top three scenes in both movies too. Yeah. So w- while we were watching this, we watched the original first and while we were watching the original, cause we had seen this version dozens of times over Katrina and I's 13 years together. Um, we've watched this movie probably twice a year. Um, oh. And it's, it's, it is one of our go-tos. It's just an easy movie to watch. And she's like, that's word for word the same. Like we hadn't even watched <laughs> the new one. She's like, that's word for word the same. Like if you're not going to, yeah. if you don't like her, you're not going to like her. Um, yeah. But what I like about this one is the first one, once Tom Hanks finds it, or not, uh, once Jimmy Stewart finds out, he, it, it's not a long period of time. Like it's a couple of weeks and he, he doesn't really acknowledge it until like the day that he's going to reveal who he is. And he kind of plays with her a little bit. What I like about this one is that he decides to become friends with her. Like he, he comes up to her and is like, I want to be friends. And she's, I like, I like that in um, that intention on his part that he wants to be friends with her. I don't know how that's possible in the situation that they find themselves right. in. And in this movie, the way that he goes about it feels so weird and manipulative to me. I agree. Like, I like the and, sentiment and I like it as a movie, yeah. but it is very manipulative and kind of sociopathic. And yeah. And, and again, it's like, it's charming and it's okay, I guess, because in the movie, she doesn't mind it and she lets right. it happen. So like, who are we to say? But um, I think this movie wants you to, not think about the real world and how people would really right. react. And and to that point, there's a scene where he, they're not friends at all yet. Uh, her shop has just gone out of business and she gets sick and he brings her some flowers and he basically lets himself into and, her house yeah. and they end up in her bedroom and he's just like sitting next to her. And at that point I'm like, why would this woman let this guy who she doesn't like, who's put her out of business into her house and then into the bedroom. She like crawls into bed and he's sitting there and like within five minutes. And then he puts his hand on her face. Like she's about yeah. to say something mean and he puts his hand like over her mouth and it's sort of like, don't say something you'll regret or whatever. And I'd be like, bite his fucking fingers off. Who is he's yeah, a stranger? And, and we did skip a pretty major scene. So he has um his aunt who's like ten years old and his brother his dad's a fucking pimp. Yeah. And so he goes to the store before his store even opens with his little brother and his aunt, who's, you know, 20, 30 years younger than him, um, yeah. because these kids love this store. So they kind of had a meet cute and they kind of had this rapport and she was very disappointed. Except- yeah, except the first thing that he did was lie to her because she didn't. He didn't reveal. But he didn't. That lie. He knows who she is. Yeah. Well, uh, come on. He was. Which dishonest. is a big point of the movie. Like, I yeah, never yeah, lied. Exactly. Yeah. So the first thing that he ever does is lie to her, and then he lies to her again when they try to start a relationship. Yeah. No, it's definitely, and this is what I think is is key to romantic comedies. For every movie like this, you have whatever movies Catherine Heigl has done, which none of them have been great. I think the biggest thing justice with, for Heigl. Yeah. What you do when you have movies like this, like if you were to put, let's say Ashton Kutcher and Catherine Heigl who have been in a movie and you did the same movie with them, I don't think it works. 
No, absolutely not. Yeah, so it's like that's especially because Ashton Kutcher is kind of fucking creepy. Yeah, I uh, like I think you could do this with Paul Rudd and some other you know like well I think like Amy uh, McAdams and Paul Rudd kind of thing like you got to get those caliber of actors like if you get yeah. somebody the wrong actor in a movie like this I think even Harry Met Sally which is one of the greatest romantic comedies of all time which this movie has a lot of Harry Met Sally kind of vibes too with the when they're developing their relationship because Harry and Sally didn't like each other. So I see a lot of parallels to that. But if you were to take Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan out of that and put lesser actors in there, I think Harry Met Sally could be a garbage movie. It really yeah. matters the actors that you put in there. It doesn't matter yeah. how great your dialogue is. If you have a shitty actor or just somebody who's not likable, they could be a good actor, but maybe they're just not right for romantic comedy. Like Gerard Butler is not somebody I want to see <laughs> in a romantic comedy. Uh, we got to do Greenland, dude. I'm so stoked. I've to heard that. it's really good. It, it looks like it might be okay. Uh, a couple podcasts that I, I actually really trust their opinions have been like, no, this movie's good. Like, we're not saying it ironically. Like, go watch this movie. So Tight. I have no idea what um, it's about, but it, it's good. it sounds like we're wrapping up a little bit. Yeah. Get in there. Okay. So while we're, while we're on the topic of actors, uh, I want to shout out my two favorite cameos in this movie. One is uh, the elevator guy. They get they all get stuck in the elevator, and they're like at a fancy New York apartment or whatever. So they have a guy running the elevator that's played by the same dude that is uh, Babyface Nelson in um, Oh Brother Where Art Thou. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then um, I, now I forget who he is in this movie. He just has like he has one line. He's like a um, I want to say he's a hospital attendant or something. It ends up being Victor Zaz from uh, Birds of Prey. Uh, he is, oh, he's the, um, the salesperson at Fox Books. Oh, yeah, Books. that's right. Yeah. When After that... Meg Ryan loses her job, she goes to Fox Books to sulk. And this woman comes in and is like, I need to get a, a book for my kid. I don't know what, it, I, it's called the shoe book. I don't know anything else about it. And this salesman comes over and he's like, oh, uh, you know, check the S section. And Meg Ryan is within earshot. And she's like, it's by this fucking author. These books are good. You probably want to start with this one. Like she knows all of her shit. And the woman's like, oh, thank you. And then, and then he's like. How, what's the, what's the author's name? How do you, how do you spell the How do you spell name? that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah so Which is funny because that's very similar to the scene in uh, in Shop Around the Corner, the original, where um, Clara comes in and gets the job by pretending to be a salesperson. Yeah, that probably was a direct homage to that. It's funny that scene yeah. that you brought up when we were watching that. Katrina's like, "Who is that guy? Was he in Sex in the City? Was he in this?" And we were both like, "Yeah, he's definitely something." And yeah, like Victor's ass. I ended up going through the IMDb and finding him. God, he was great in that movie. I, I love Birds and Prey. That was this, probably my favorite movie I saw in theaters last year besides Tenet. This movie had a surprisingly good cast. Um, you know, obviously Tom and Meg. Um, and, you know, Greg Kinnear, I think at that point, that was a, a good, nice little Parker run for Posey's him in the good. 90s. Parker Posey could have been anybody else, and this is early in her career, so that was good. Steve Zahn, uh, Dave Chappelle before he was, you know, who he is. Um, our buddy Victor Zaz. Uh, Michael Badalucco is Babyface Nelson. Um, uh, Deborah Rush is in this, and she's been in some other stuff. Um, the the chick uh, from Sarah Ramirez. Which one is that? The the other Which coworker shop? at the shop. She's the oh, Miss yeah, yeah. Congeniality. The April twenty fifth. Oh, that's who that. Yeah, yeah. I was I was gonna say her, and I couldn't remember who else, what other what else she's in. Heather Burns. Yeah. Um. And Sarah Ramirez is uh, the cashier at the. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's also in Spider Man. Is she? She's got a little cameo. She's the uh, a cop at the carjacking or something. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you know, a lot of people. Nice. But overall, uh, just to start wrapping this up, solid movie. Like I think this is exactly what I think a remake should be. In that it it's very it's very obvious what it's redoing but it does its own thing yeah it's faithful so. but it has its own twist it does its own thing and it's it's good it's a fun movie and i think in you know like i already said in lesser actors hands this could have been really bad but it's it's one of our go-tos it's a it's a fun movie yeah i think if you are under the age of 30 and you don't have nostalgia for this movie or the people in it or whatever then you might not get as much out of it um and it definitely feels a little uh, dated or problematic with some of the things, but still worth watching and enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, bud. T give us your plugs. Right, Where man. can our, our listeners find you? 
Yeah, I'm on Instagram at disalexic, D-Y-S, Alex, I-C. I'm on Twitter at Polishi. And if you want to follow along with what I'm watching, I'm on Letterboxd, also at Polishi, P-U-L-I-S-C-I. And if you guys want to uh, follow us, uh, the podcast, you can go to mdxpods.com, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at mdxpods. Uh, you can also support the show at patreon.com slash mdxpods. I do have to give a big shout out to our newest patron, uh, Scarlett. Thank you for uh, supporting the show. She uh, is chipping in a buck a month. But you know what? That's, that's all you need to get the goods. And it really helps out the show. Uh, helps us cover rentals, web costs. Um, Web hosting fees, all that. Uh, and what we want to do. Every bit helps. Every bit helps. Good Check us deal. out. And uh, thanks for listening.